All right. Hey, everyone. How was that for a no audio introduction to sponsorship? That's my fault. Sorry, Capital One Cafe. But at least we got to see uh, Ben kind of mouth the words to thank our sponsors. Probably all seen him enough by now, but um, shout out to all the sponsors of Denver Startup Week. They're how we uh, are able to bring this to everybody live uh, for free. Denver Startup Week is the largest free startup focus event in the world. That's so cool. Y'all made it. This is the last day. This is one of the best sessions too. So Welcome everyone, my name is Ryan Margolis. I am one of the co-chairs of the Product Track and I'm a member of the organizing committee of Denver Startup Week. Um, at Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, sexual orientation, or the combination of any of those. There is something for everyone at Denver Startup Week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of it. Um, this session in particular, we're talking about the seven deadly sins of product liability. Um, a really unique take uh, from some, some experts in the field. I think something that um, gets overlooked in, in building and designing and developing new products often. So should be hugely helpful. Um, I'll turn it over to the panel. I'm going to pull up some slides to, to go from here. Last thing I'll note is feel free to engage in the chat. Feel free to engage uh, over Q&A. Um, the, the, uh, the panelists will be able to take some of the questions as well. But otherwise, we've got a nice slate of, of content to go through. Um, and I'll let the others jump in and, and pull the slides right up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maureen Witt. I'm with the law firm of Holland and Hart and welcome to our presentation on the seven deadly sins of product liability. Our panelists today are from our law firm of Holland and Hart. We're a regional law firm in the Western United States uh, through Alaska. And we also have an office in Washington, DC. So we have 13 offices in total and about 440 attorneys in all of our offices. Uh, we do work on a state, regional, national, and international level, despite the fact that most of our offices are located in the Western United States, we have an international reach. And our panelists today are all specialists in product regulatory matters, product liability issues, and product liability litigation defense. We have two speakers from our Salt Lake City office, Brent Johnson and Nathan Archibald and three from our Denver office, Lee Gray and myself who do product liability work. We also have Joe Ramirez, who's actually a specialist, not in product liability, but in insurance coverage, which is a very important topic for a young or very seasoned company uh, regarding product liability. We're gonna talk to you today about the seven deadly sins of product liability. So if we could pull that slide up, which I think is the next one. The seven deadly sins as we see them of product liability are first, not knowing the safety regulations and standards that apply to your product and your industry. The second is sloppy record keeping. The third is failing to warn of hazards related to your product. The fourth is providing inadequate instructions for safe use. The fifth is sloppy marketing. The sixth is ignoring customer complaints and the seventh is skimping on insurance coverage. And we're gonna have Lee Gray of our Denver office address the first two topics. Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Maureen. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I can uh, start chatting here a little bit. Um, and one of the first uh, sins is not knowing the applicable safety regulations uh, for your product. Uh, anything made in the United States, made or sold in the US uh, likely has um, almost certainly has some kind of regulatory touch to it, something that matters uh, related to either uh, the pre-marketing approval um, from the FDA. Uh, FDA governs uh, whether you can um, market a uh, medical device or a pharmaceutical. Um, in the case of uh, food, you need to uh, have your labels uh, looked at, or at least the nutritional supplements, you need to give them notice of your uh, of your labels if you're making certain claims uh, as to the ingredients of them. Um, and uh, the uh, specifications, uh, there are many kind of product specifications 
that come from different federal uh, federal agencies. Uh, again, uh, FDA has certain ones. Uh, USDA also uh, governs food, and they would have uh, um, different uh, regulations related to meat products, uh, typically. Uh, I, one example that I often give uh, folks that I'm talking to as far as the difference between the FDA and the USDA is if you uh, make and sell cheese pizza, uh, frozen pizzas, uh, those are going to be governed by the FDA uh, if they're packaged foods. However, if you have pepperoni on those cheese pizzas, then suddenly it goes over to the USDA because it's considered a meat product. Uh, they both have different regs uh, related to the, the product labeling, what's required and what's on there. Um, and then uh, there are certain kinds of uh, specifications for different types of products. Uh, the CPSC, uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, for example, has uh, a lot of different regulations related to either chemicals in your products, or perhaps um, if you make bicycles, uh, they have certain kind of testing that you have to do for uh, strength and uh, things like that. Um, there are safety requirements uh, for various uh, products, either uh, in the warning uh, for different things or including uh, specific um, elements of uh, safe guards for your products as well. Uh, advertising and labeling is obviously an important issue uh, that FDA, USDA, uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, governs different kinds of uh, aspects of advertising and labeling. Um, th they uh, can govern your, your green marketing claims. If you have uh, claims related to uh, recyclability of either the product itself or the packaging, um, th there are certain rules that uh, govern what you can and can't say, uh, non-toxic claims, uh, claims about the ingredients of the products. Uh, there are a lot of uh, rules that govern what you can and can't say when you can say certain things. Um, and again, uh, the CPSC, uh, they have um, the Poison Prevention Packaging Act uh, that governs certain uh, chemicals uh, in your products. Uh, I had a, a client <laughs> who had uh, wintergreen uh, flavor in uh, one of their uh, food items, but they had it in enough of a concentration where it was considered a, a hazardous substance that uh, if a child had too much of it, they could have um, problems. So um, this, uh, this could uh, basically govern their, either their shipping with the Department of Transportation. Uh, they have the hazardous materials and things like that. Um, and that would uh, govern how you label your packaging for uh, shipping. Uh, lithium ion batteries are another example. Uh, again, we're not getting into details of these things, but just enough to let you know that there are a lot of things that may be clear or may not be so clear uh, as to the federal regulations that govern uh, different aspects of almost any kind of product. Um, uh, and there are also state regulations as well. Uh, California is best known for them with their uh, Prop 65 list of uh, hazardous chemicals that you have to put special warning labels on for those. Um, and uh, there's also uh, other types of uh, state regulations. Uh, CBD companies may be uh, listening in. Uh, every state is either going to have a, uh, a hemp plan under uh, the uh, USDA, or if they don't, a few states lately have been withdrawing their hemp plans so that you are governed by the USDA's hemp plan. And they have certain requirements uh, for testing and, um, and what you have to do as far as destruct destruction of product if it uh, has high enough THC levels. Um, California and other states have um, consumer protection type uh, laws that would govern your product labeling in any alleged misrepresentation you may have uh, concerning your product. Uh, you've probably heard of um, the, the um, Palm Wonderful or uh, Kind Bars with the nutritional uh, claims they were making on there, uh, all natural, things like that. Uh, those are going to be state regulations that govern those kind of claims, what you can and can't say. And uh, there are plenty of plaintiff's lawyers out there that are bringing lawsuits every day uh, as to various claims made on products uh, and these state regulations as well as the federal regulations kind of have the playing field and uh, there's a lot of squishy stuff in there so you have to be careful with the, the product claims which uh, uh, but 
there'll be uh, Brent, I believe, will be talking about that later, so I won't get too much into that. Uh, next slide, please. And there are uh, also uh, safety standards by private companies that uh, are standard agencies. Uh, that some examples there are UL listing, ISO, uh, ASTM. Uh, these are the uh, standards that they put out for um, either your manufacturing facilities. Uh, ISO 9001 uh, is a big example that a lot of companies have uh, in order to see, uh, meet certain um, requirements to uh, be certified for that. Uh, medical device companies, for example, are um, labeled, uh, not labeled, excuse me, are uh, have to meet um, either the uh, good manufacturing practices uh, that FDA sets forth, but those are based loosely uh, on ISO uh, 13485, which is a, a standard specifically for medical device manufacturers. So um, you are, it would be good to know what standards govern your product but uh, the ones that govern your product may also govern your facilities and uh, have some requirements, uh, clean rooms or certain other types of requirements for the layout of your facility or things like that. Uh, of course, there are also standards for product performance. Uh, UL uh, Laboratories does a lot of testing um, uh, for electric appliances and things like that. Um, ASTM standards uh, have a lot of uh, set standards for things uh, in the medical device industry, for example, uh, surgical masks. Uh, a lot of new companies in the U.S. are trying to make surgical masks because we have discovered, thanks to COVID, uh, that we don't make enough of them here and are reliant on foreign uh, companies, foreign, excuse me, companies and countries to, uh, to send those here. So uh, ASTM has certain standards uh, related to fluid resistance, uh, filtration efficiency, uh, breathability, flammability, things like that, uh, that if you you have to meet those standards as part of the uh, pre-market approval process with the FDA. Um, those ASTM has standards in ISO as well, have standards for all kinds of products across every spectrum of uh, industry. Uh, so uh, consumer products and things like that. So you'll need to know what voluntary standards there are that govern your product. And you should also know that those standards when viewed in a product liability case are gonna be seen as the floor and not the uh, ceiling. So you'll need to uh, not only meet those standards, but exceed them in some ways, or at least be able to show that you have, which brings us to the next deadly sin of, uh, in the next slide, of uh, sloppy record keeping. Uh, basically the rule is, is if it isn't recorded, it didn't happen. You need to have uh, standard operating procedures for the, the, the things that you do as part of your uh, manufacturing process. You should have design files that show how you designed the product, how it was uh, changed over time. And those design files should have sign-offs. So uh, responsible people uh, govern the, the change in those designs over time. Um, and this is just a list here that you can see uh, your, your ingredients. Uh, you should have certifications if necessary from your ingredient suppliers, um, your procedures and protocols for how people in different aspects of your business do their jobs, uh, quality and performance testing that you do. Uh, you need to record the results from all of that. Uh, shipping records. Uh, if there's ever a product recall, uh, then you're going to have to reverse distribute your product and you need to keep the shipping records to find out where it went, when it went, how it went. Um, and then, of course, you need to keep those over time. Uh, different industries have different standards, but you'll need to keep historical records to show how, you know, what you did with products several years ago, if uh, there could be an issue with liability related to those products after time. And very importantly, the customer complaints. Uh, you need to record and keep uh records of all customer complaints. And then those complaints don't just sit in your customer service department. They need to be feeding into the rest of your process. They need to feed into product design. Do you need to change a design because of a problem? Uh, they need to go to management. So management can make decisions on uh, where, you know, where capital goes for improvements and things like that. So all of these aspects of your company need to have adequate record keeping that is maintained. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, going to the uh, topic of product recalls, uh, you have to document 
various elements we just talked about, the production, the testing, the uh, shipping and everything before you need it. Because when you have a problem with your product, uh, let's say it's a, a lithium ion battery in a computer or some device that uh, is catching on fire and causing problems, you're going to need to do something immediately. Uh, these things always seem to happen on Fridays. You're going to have to get this done immediately. And you have the, I have the word immediate in quotes there, uh, the regulators such as the CPSC or the FDA, depending on who is regulating your product, uh, have requirements that you immediately notify them if you have to, uh, if you have to recall a product. Uh, at least with respect to the CPSC, immediate means within 48 hours of anybody in your company having knowledge of the problem. And so traceability is a very key aspect to limiting the scope of your recall if you can. Uh, if you have unique product identifiers, like with medical devices, or you can have lot batch numbers, like with food items, just basically things where you can limit if once you realize there's a problem with a certain batch of pro product, then you can identify that and, and limit your recall to that instead of everything that you've made uh, over time. If you have customer information where you're shipping product directly on the internet sales or things like that, then you can send them direct notice of it and don't have to rely on um, newspapers for your uh, notices of, um, of the uh, uh, product recall. So that is uh, a very quick <laughs> rundown of two of our uh, deadly sins. So we can go, go now to uh, failing to warn of hazards as the third. And I believe is that uh, you, Nathan? Okay, am I unmute? Unmute, unmuted. Hopefully you can yes. hear me because I'm going to start talking. Okay, great. So this is number three on the list. It's high on the list because failing to warn of hazards, it's, it's an easy fix if you do it right. Um, so let, let's start with the first question. What is your duty to warn? So let's assume, and hopefully this is a valid assumption, that you are putting a product to market that is as safe as possible. Um, but you cannot make the product safe in every conceivable way and in every possible use. Um, as, as the John Wick movies show, um, anything can be deadly if you have enough imagination. Uh, so therein arises your duty is to adequately warn users and buyers of the dangers that exist in using your product. Um, this duty to warn, it's a relatively new idea um, in product liability, but it's become the most common allegation found in liability lawsuits in the US today. Um, in, in other words, companies are getting better at designing and building things. Um, manufacturing standards are higher, quality control is better. Um, so the notion of liability based on a design flaw or some sort of impurity uh, is getting harder for plaintiff's lawyers to find. And so that's being overtaken in the courts by a lawsuit predicated on a product that works how it's supposed to work, um, but on the ground that the manufacturer failed to discharge a duty to warn with respect to a potential hazard uh, that's in that product. Um, so in tandem with that judge-made uh, law, legislators and regulators are also coming up with new ways, new and novel ways to require companies to provide warnings. Uh, so we're, we're here on a, uh, we're dealing with both the common law uh, and statute uh, and regulatory agency action. Um, so in, uh, as far as the regulations go, uh, Lee uh, covered um, uh, some of those just recently. Um, I'll maybe list off a few. There's far too many to, to go through here, but uh, so for example, food products, you have to warn of the big eight allergens for tobacco products there's required warnings. For cosmetics, you know, if there's an unknown safety record for an ingredient, warning required. Uh, for children's toys, certain warnings required. For household products with toxic um, or hazardous substances, uh, there's a warning required. Um, uh, so those are some examples under federal law. Uh, Lee also mentioned an example under state law. Uh, you have Prop 65. Uh, the famous California law, which requires that if you have a cancer-causing or reproductively harmful chemical uh, that you could that your product could expose someone to, then you have to give a warning. 
So the underlying theory here is both of the, the common judgment law and, and the statutory schemes is consumer empowerment. Uh, it's the idea that if the consumer knows the hazard, um, that they will act accordingly. Um, doesn't always work that way, but that's, that's the theory. Um, so the next question is when to provide a warning. Um, now, this is easy when you're talking about a statutory warning. Um, you warn when the statute tells you to. Um, and there's usually, um, depending on the statute, there's usually a defined test that you can that you can conduct to determine whether the statutory threshold applies. Um, but for, for warnings that fall outside of that um, of that rubric, which, which most warnings will, it's uh, it's more of a balancing exercise because only reasonable, foreseeable dangers are subject to this requirement. Um, and, and courts, when they're looking at this. Uh, reasonable foreseeability, they look at a number of factors. Um, so the first is, you know, what is the gravity of the risk posed by the product and the likelihood that it would cause injury to an uninformed consumer? So th there's two sides to that, numer to that calculus. There's the numerical risk uh, versus the severity of the outcome. So in, in one famous case, you had a polio vaccine um, and there was a one in a million chance of contracting polio by taking the vaccine. Um, so the calculus there, severe outcome, getting polio versus the likelihood of it occurring was one in a million. Um, and so that weighed in favor of a warning. Um, you know, you compare that to another famous case uh, where you had a, a one millionth of 1% chance of a very non-fatal allergic reaction to shampoo. So the calculus there weighed the other way. Um, so we're talking about a small class of people who may have a hypersensitivity or, or is this a risk that everyone is exposed to? Um, that's the, the first factor. The second factor is, um, you know, who is the class of, of users uh, expected to use the product? Uh, is it a particularly vulnerable class of people like children perhaps or is, is it a drug targeted at a specific health condition? Uh, number three, you, you, we're looking at the setting under which the product is likely used. Um, is, is that a particularly is it a particularly risky uh, uh, setting? Uh, the next question is: uh, once you've figured out that you do want to warn, how do you do it? Uh, when you're talking about the statutes uh, that require a warning, well, they will tell you how, how to give the warning, and, and most statutes will give it down to the granular level of. Uh, what words to use, what size font, what color scheme. Um, outside of that, if, if you're talking about just a common law warning, uh, the standard that courts use is it has to be an adequate, adequate warning. Um, and, and there's no definition, no hard and fast definition of what, that, of what an adequate warning is. So there's a level of kind of common sense uh, at play here. Um, and the, the sort of common sense things that you should be looking at, well, warning should be conspicuous, uh, they should be unambiguous, they should be difficult to overlook or, or to ignore, uh, and they should present the information with a level of intensity that is commensurate with the gravity of the risk. Um, so that said, we're not always trusted with, with common sense, and so some of the industry groups that, that Lee uh, referred to earlier, ISO, um, uh, ANSI, they have created a, a set of voluntary uh, safety standards um, and forms, you know, particular symbols that you can use that, that, that are uh, intended to convey certain meanings. Um, so what are the exceptions uh, to the warning requirements? Well, the first general exception is that there's no duty to warn um, of an obvious danger. Um, but bear in mind, what is obvious to your engineers or to your design, product, product designers may not be obvious to everyone else. Um, second exception is um, you don't have to necessarily give a warning if uh, the users of the product have a, a special expertise uh, in, in the use of the product. Uh, so the third and last exception I'll talk about is uh, you only need to warn of dangers that are known to or reasonably foreseeable to you as the manufacturer. So it means if someone misuses a product um, in an unforeseeable way, then no warning is required. Um, next slide, please. 
So is there a risk, a risk of overwarning? Um, that there's been a lot of discussion uh, about, this, about this risk. Uh, I'm going to read a quick quote from one court who said, if a manufacturer had to list all sources of friction or all sources of sparks as a means of warning of a flammability hazard, its warning label would have to be of epic or encyclopedic uh, proportions. So th there's a lot of discussion about this, this risk of overwarning, um, the unintended consequence. Um, and it's not just about overwarning on one product. It, it's about too many warnings across the board desensitizing consumers. Um, now, the flip side of that is if you're on the fence about a particular warning um, and if your marketing team is giving you grief <laughs> uh, about the, the potential negative consumer perception uh, after reading a warning, um, you know, perhaps this white noise that we've talked about with warnings could give you some, some pause here because perhaps consumers are, are just going to ignore it uh, anyway. It's, it's not going to have the huge negative impact that your marketing team might think. Um, so with all that, um, uh, that is the number three sin failure to warn. I hope this has been fair warning for you. I'm going to turn it over to Brant, who's going to talk about the related topic of uh, instructions for use. Hi there, um, Brent Johnson. I am going to give you a very, very fascinating recitation of how to do instructions and how to do them properly. But first, if you look behind me, you'll see this marvelous generic city. Uh, it's, it's overcast in this generic city today. I don't know why, because it's clear out my window here in Park City, Utah. But I will tell you this, if you don't care about what's behind you, if you think it's all fake or that you know better, congratulations, you are the average consumer when it comes to instruction. Nobody reads them. Well, that's not true. Some people read them. Most don't. I, uh, I'm looking over here and I have a Breville coffee maker, an espresso maker that I bought two weeks ago. It was a significant buy on my part and I'm pushing 60 now and, and I've never had this before. I've always gone to Starbucks, but I bought this. And it came with a manual, a user's manual. Did I read the user, user's manual? Of course not. So what did I do? I went online. I mean, first of all, I thought I've been buying espresso drinks for so many years. I, I know how they're made. But because it was, I was uncertain and the machine looked complicated, I went online and watched a couple of videos. And they weren't even made by Breville. They were just people who were, you know, probably promoters of Breville. But they, they were great videos. What I'm saying is that we're going to talk about instructions here. And they are important. In fact, they are critical to protecting yourself from product liability lawsuits. You need to take them seriously, but at the same time, you need to recognize that it's very hard to get folks to actually read them or pay attention to them, which makes it even more challenging to write instructions. So uh, the question is, how do you go about, there's a particular statute, federal or state, mostly federal, that requires certain warnings. That's not frequently the case, but when it is, you better make sure that you know the statute and that you're giving the warning. For example, the, Fez, the Federal Hazardous Substance Act requires certain warnings and instructions on uh, the safe storage, the safe use, and even the first aid aspects of using that product. So, you know, you need to make sure that you understand and it's, it certainly wouldn't be, wouldn't hurt to consult with a lawyer to find out whether or not you have a particular federal statute that requires some sort of instructions uh, on use, storage, or first aid. You need to make sure you understand that. Then, I mean, once you get past that, then the question is, what about instructions? What, what is the point of them? And the point is primarily if not exclusively, to uh, have a defense in a product liability lawsuit. And the defense is we told the consumer in no uncertain terms how to safely use our product. So that's it. I mean, whatever you, the instructions that you write, or if you have an attorney write them, that's great too. It's expensive to have an attorney write them because they're long if you've ever tried to read any of them. Um, but 
they need to provide detailed, very specific instructions on what is safe use, how to engage in safe use exactly step by step from setting up to operating, to cleaning, to maintaining, to repairing the product. Um, those instructions will keep you out of a world of trouble uh, if somebody is injured. The other thing that you need to remember, and this is often forgotten, is that some products just beg misuse. Uh, you know, I, I do product liability defense work. You know, I've seen cases where people use a staple gun and they do crazy stuff with staple guns. <laughs> and your instructions to not only describe and particularize the safe use of the staple gun, but it should explain things in terms of what is not safe use of that staple gun. Uh, so you have to not only instruct on safe use, but also instruct on non-safe use and how to avoid it. Um, the instructions must be clear, must be complete, and they must be adequately communicated. And that's what we're gonna talk about now, is how to adequately communicate safe use instructions. Well, if you uh, look here, you will see, like, how do you go about it? I mean, it's almost a daunting task. If you're not a lawyer, and even if you are, frankly, when you think about it, it's very difficult to sit down in front of your uh, laptop and just bang out safe use instructions. So how do you go about doing it? Well, first, as you can see on this slide here, there is guidance provided by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, you should consult that. It's, they have a manual. It's great. You should look at it. You should see how it applies to what you're doing in terms of drafting safe use instructions and apply the standards. There's also ANSI guidance as well. And you know, you, you gotta pay for that typically. They have um, manuals. Um, they're a lot more technical, a lot more in the weeds, a lot more difficult to understand. By the same token, they're very helpful. So you can consult those as well. Um, once you get beyond that, the question is, what do you do? Well, the, the, the critical things, really before you even consult the Consumer Product Safety Commission manual or ANSI guidance or, or just Google randomly your product or products like your product, uh, you need to figure out who's gonna use your product. Sometimes you have technical folks who are gonna use it. And I do a lot of work and I'm gonna get into the next section for out to outdoor retailers. And despite the fact that go out and do crazy things they should have no right doing in terms of backcountry skiing, hiking, climbing, um, less and less of them are sophisticated. And yet retail, outdoor retailers tend to view their products as communicating to that technical audience that really understands what's going on. So you can sit there and say, oh yeah, I am I, the people I'm appealing to, the people who are gonna buy my products, uh, technical, they have, they have a certain expertise, either they're climbers or if you sell <clears throat> home improvement products, you know, the people who use them understand how to do home improvements. None of that is true. In fact, the opposite is true. And if you ever assume that, you're going to get in trouble. So you can, you need to understand who your audience is. But if your audience is a technical audience, ignore that. But if your audience or the users are going to be kids, heaven forbid, or old people, which are an increasing portion of our population, you need to understand how they interpret and digest information and, how, and their likely use of the product and draft your instructions accordingly. Uh, that's sort of assessing the product profile risk. Um, you then need to figure out how you're going to properly instruct. And this is, this is a fun area to work in these days for me because there are so many different ways of instructing. I mean, the traditional tried and true is like my Breville espresso maker, you get a manual. Uh, you can go online and you can look and they'll have some information as well. But you get, a, you get a paper manual in black and white that's incredibly uninteresting to look at or read. Um, there are reports that are greatly disputed 
<clears throat> however, that 65% of humans are visual learners, which may explain why, and I'm not, just so you know, I'm, I'm a guy who, if you look at diagrams and pictures, I don't get it. But I, I'm good at reading words because I went to law school. So, but 65% of the population are visual learners. And that's why when you buy Ikea furniture, uh, which I have bought plenty of, and then I get my wife to, to, <laughs> to construct it, they're almost all pictures. It's just picture after picture after picture after picture. That's one way to provide instructions and it's very useful. And it, according to statistics, it, it appeals to a lot of users. And they're more likely to look at a manual if it has a bunch of pictures in it than if it's just English language or French or Spanish, whatever language it's in. But you need to kind of assess that with the understanding that a lot of people are visual learners and having that kind of pictographic material is extremely useful in helping people understand. It also makes them more interested in reading or, or looking at the manual. Also, it doesn't hurt to have videos. Uh, I would greatly suggest that the videos have to be done very carefully, and very accurately, so that the people are wearing the right safety equipment. They're engaged in completely safe practices, including having two people pick up heavy objects, all of that stuff. Uh, but videos are extremely useful, and people who are who purchase a new product, like my my espresso machine, are more likely really to go online and look for how to operate it than to spend a bunch of time. Uh, reading instructions to, to figure it out. So there you go. That is um, how to engage in or how to write and to otherwise create adequate safe use instructions. If you don't do it, there are so many lawsuits out there where the instructions are inadequate, incomplete, uh, and consumers will sue on that. And even if you have great instructions, you may still get sued, but you have the defense of saying, look, if they had read the manual and followed it, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I have the next um, subject as well, which is sloppy marketing. This is uh, number five. Um, I, I went to school in Michigan, uh, a big Bob Seger fan. And as a lawyer, I've always thought of this, this passage or quote from Hollywood Nights, which is with a passion that kills. And really that's when you get to marketing, this is the key issue. Um, startup companies in particular, but even major brands are so stoked, so excited about their new products that they can't, they're unique, they're, they're amazing, they defy logics, they're so incredible. And, and if, you know, if you didn't have that attitude about your products, you wouldn't be in the business you're in, you wouldn't have a startup. But is that passion that can lead to some very unfortunate results. We'll go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Here's an example, and, and I don't think Johnson Johnson was ever really passionate. I mean, maybe at some point about baby oil, but this gives you an example of how marketing problems, and I don't mean, you know, I use sloppy to as a description, but it's not so much sloppy as it's, um, it's too simple, too intended to, to, to convince people to buy the product and therefore not careful enough. This is a, a very sad case of a young boy who's 15 months old. His sister, I think, if I remember it correctly, had a little container of Johnson Johnson's baby oil, not in the, not in the original wrapping, but in a, you know, a little filler bottle in her purse. <clears throat> the 15 year old, the 15 month old boy went in and saw it and like most 15 month old children thought he might drink it. Um, his mom, this is the really unfortunate part. His mom came into the room while he was attempting to drink it and yelled because she didn't know what it was. She was scared. And he, the, the 15 year old boys, 50 month old boys reaction was to inhale deeply. The inhalation uh, resulted in the baby oil getting into his lungs. Uh, he coughed, he had the usual symptoms of somebody who's inhaled something, <clears throat> but the mom didn't take him to the hospital right away. Didn't seem like he needed it. Didn't seem like he was struggling. 
But over time, it became clear that something had happened to his lungs and he was not getting enough oxygen. He was ultimately taken to the hospital. And by that time, he had sustained brain damage from lack of oxygen. Now, in the lawsuit against Johnson and Johnson, you know, obviously their defense is, well, this is, a, this is an unforeseen use. I mean, we, you know, we, we wouldn't even warn about this because it's so freaky. But the plaintiffs, the parents basically said, you know, when we saw what it was, we figured out it was baby oil. We weren't worried because this product was advertised by Johnson & Johnson as pure and gentle. And therefore, if something's pure and gentle, even if it's ingested, the worst that will happen is there could be diarrhea. That was enough in, in certain respects for the court to say, yeah, you know, when you're out there touting your product as pure and gentle, you're making representations about the product. And a reasonable consumer might think they didn't need to go to the hospital if their kid inhaled it. So that's kind of an example of a problem, problems you can have with your marketing scheme. Can I have the next slide, please? This one, you know, this is how bad it can get. Uh, I think this was in the 90s. A, the, a guy purchased a Jeep CJ7, which was advertised on television at the time through a series of ads where the drivers were taking the Jeep up Pikes Peak. And there's a lot of J turns. I mean, I've, I've never driven Pikes Peak, but there's a lot of J turns, very difficult driving. And they're driving and they're driving like this. They're, they don't have safety equipment on, belts on. They're having a good time, uh, enjoying themselves. And, and this man purchased it. He and his friend went out and they actually did Pikes Peak. They, I think it was Pikes Peak. They flew off the mountain 50 feet, landed and got severely injured. They didn't die. Um, the claim was we saw the advertisement and the advertisement had these guys driving really fast. And our conclusion was that the roll bar on the Jeep CJ7 was sufficient to protect us if they're, you know, if we flew 50 feet in the air and rolled. Now that may seem like a silly argument, but it is an argument and it worked. Um, and that's why whenever you see these driving commercials now, on the bottom of the screen will say, you know, it's a professional driver on an enclosed track. Don't ever do this. Uh, but that's, the, that's another kind of marketing where if you don't market it in a way or portray it in a way that it's being used, you can run into problems. Okay, next one, please. And this is my final summary slide here. So here you go. Don't, these are my don'ts. Okay, don't rely on the concept of puffery. Puffery, as you probably know, uh, in advertising, and I do a lot of this litigation, are statements that no reasonable consumer can rely. The, this is the greatest of this. This is best. Those are the kind of statements that if you get sued for it, um, you say, hey, it's puffery. Nobody really believes this. Don't rely on the concept of puffery when you do your advertising and in such a way that you're basically telling customers they can do things in a certain way. Don't rely on your warnings. That's sad. I know we, we've talked about that. Nathan went over it. Don't rely on them. They're great. You need to have them. But when you do your marketing, don't think that you can say or do or portray anything you want and that the warnings will cover you because they won't. Don't rely on your instructions for use, right? When I said the same reason. And then finally, and most importantly, do not ever rely on the consumer's common sense. That will get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, with that, I am done and I will turn the time over. I think is it Maureen to talk about um, the next subject, customer complaints. Thank you, Brent. I'm going to cover this topic very quickly because uh, the insurance topic that Joe Ramirez is going to cover is really important. And some of what I'm going to say is much more intuitive than what Joe has to tell you. My topic is don't ignore customer complaints. That is one of the seven deadly sins of product liability. Uh, if you listen to your customers, you will be much in a much better position to create and produce the best the safest, the most effective products. So the number one reason you want to listen to them is because you'll make the best product if you listen to your customers. Um, first topic, receive. It may seem obvious that you just received the complaint, but you actually should have a comprehensive consumer complaint handling program in place before you even get your first complaint, ideally. But if you don't have one and you've already gotten a complaint, it's never too late to institute one. 
You want to train your personnel to be courteous and clear in their communications with the customer, to acknowledge the concern that, or complaint that the customer has uh, and apologize for their inconvenience, but don't accept responsibility. You tell them not to accept responsibility, at least at the outset. You want to get as much information as you possibly can from the customer in the first instance. You want to document and save all the information that you get and all the communications that you have with the customer. You want to avoid making specific promises to the customer. You want to thank the customer for their input and their patience as you investigate. That's how you receive a complaint. The next thing is to record. You want to record all complaints in a systematic way. You want to keep the original complaint information uh, from the customer, not just paraphrase it into a computer system, because the paraphrasing often doesn't really capture what the customer is concerned about. You want to thoroughly document every step of your process from the minute you receive the complaint through its resolution. Uh, and you want to establish and enforce a comprehensive record retention policy so that you keep all of these records in an organized and systematic way, as I said. And you want to train all of your employees and agents on that policy so they know how to use it and implement it and they stick to it. And you want to have dedicated personnel looking for any repetition or trends because it's when you see repetition or trends that you're alerted to the fact that you have a more serious problem than maybe first appeared from the customer's complaint and that you may ultimately need to do a recall as Lee mentioned in his comments. Um, you often need to report, not always, but often need to report uh, a customer complaint or an adverse event as they're referred to um, by many agencies. So you wanna know what reporting, uh, what agency's reporting requirements might be implicated or involved with the product and the issue it, uh, that's been brought up. You wanna review those reporting requirements of any agency that could be involved. There may be multiple agencies involved in one issue. Uh, you want to determine first whether you have an obligation to report. You don't want to report things usually that you don't have to, but if you have to, you want to report promptly to the right person and fully. Uh, you need to retain a record again of all the information that you exchange with any agency, any report you make, to whom and when. If you don't hear back from the agency, you need to follow up, make sure that the report's been received and find out what you need to do per the agency. Um, you want to respond to any recall requests from an agency, as Lee talked about, even if they're voluntary. And um, when you issue a recall notice, you want to do that for both a voluntary and a mandatory recall. I'm not going to get too into recalls right now because we just simply don't have time, but Lee, and Lee touched on them. But remember that if you do institute a recall, it's very important to keep all of your records from start to finish. So the reporting is really important and keeping all the records of your reporting is very important. Obviously, one of the most critical things is to remedy the problem. If there's a problem with your product, you do need to address it. Um, you need to involve your R&D department if you have one. You need to investigate the complaint thoroughly, determine what the problem is, remedy the problem fully, don't do something temporary or some kind of Band-Aid solution, and document, again, all you do from the beginning through the end. And finally, don't forget to respond to the customer. Get back to the customer. Again, be polite and honest in all of your communications. Use very simple terms, plain English. Have policies in place. If you respond by social media, make sure that you have policies in place to manage how social media is used and to minimize the risks in using social media to respond. Be prompt and timely in your response. Um, be conciliatory, but don't accept responsibility if at all possible. Um, and address any inaccurate or misleading information that the, the customer might be uh, holding or having. Also consider a press release if in fact you have a serious problem of much greater scope than one or two customers. Uh, I, I'm going to leave it at that so that we can get into insurance and have um, Joe cover some very important issues for startup companies. Joe? Hi, good morning everyone. I, I know we only have a few more minutes left, but um, so, you know, as a, as a manufacturer of a product, you know, you've done everything, you've done the proper testing, you've kept good records, uh, you've given the right warnings, you've given proper use instructions, and yet you still end up getting sued. And so this is the importance of, of, of you know, how to manage this risk, how to transfer the risk of loss to another entity um, when that happens. Because even if you did everything right, and, and it's difficult to, to ever hit you 
with an adverse verdict in a trial, that's not really the exposure that kills smaller startup companies or, or just smaller manufacturing companies in general. It's the litigation expense. And so what I think a lot of people don't, don't realize is, you know, when you purchase general liability insurance, you're getting two different types of protection. Um, you're getting protection in the event, you know, you were ever to um, receive an adverse verdict in a, in a trial, it, it would pay for that verdict or some, in most cases get settled, but it, it would pay for those settlements if there's a potential um, liability exposure. But to me, the most important thing that general liability insurance provides is defense of cases. So if you get sued, and again, if you've done everything right and your lawyer is telling you, you know, it, this is likely not a case to settle. This is something that even if we were to take to trial, you're probably going to win. Um, the insurance company has to pay for that defense all the way through a verdict, all the way through an appeal if you need to appeal it. Um, and and those, that's where the big numbers are. You know, on some of these cases, if they're catastrophic type injuries, you know, the defense of cases can run into sometimes a million dollars or more. Um, and so the, the beauty of it, and we switch over to the next slide so I can uh, jump through this a little bit quickly. Um, so the, the general liability coverage will provide both uh, protection against issues that may happen on your premises and during your operations. But, but when you're a product manufacturer, the important coverage is the product's completed operations coverage. That's the one that will protect you in the event that someone is alleging that your product caused them um, physical injury or harm. Um, and, and so one of the things that happens with smaller companies, right, because smaller companies are, are new to the market, they don't have a, a really solid loss history that underwriters could look at, um, ten, tends to limit that insurance market so that when your broker goes out and tries to find underwriters willing to provide you with insurance, there's not that many insurers. Um, and the ones that are willing to take a chance on you are going to come back with pretty high premiums. And so I've heard uh, and seen, unfortunately, smaller companies either saying, ah, you know, we're just starting off. Uh, we probably aren't going to be facing um, suits in the, until, you know, years down the road. So, so maybe we skimp on, on the insurance um, or maybe we, we go with really low limits policies. Um, and, and I got to tell you that that is a mistake because these lawsuits can happen at any given time, right? They can happen over anything. Like I said, e even in your operations at your, at your uh, business location and some, some vendor were to come by and slip and fall, you know, that, that's a potential claim against you, which GL coverage would, would uh, provide protection against. Um, but so, so what is good is as you start developing a history with an insurer over a period of time, and they see that the products that you're putting out there are safe and you're not generating many um, losses, then you, um, then you can um, eventually, the market expands, you've got more underwriters willing to write, and then your prices will, will start to go down. Um, we can go ahead and skip to the next slide. So some of the quick concepts, right? So uh, general liability insurance, uh, one of the great things about it is that the defense costs are not included in your limit of liability. So if you, if you take out a million dollar policy um, and then you do end up getting sued and, and your insurance company has to pay a million dollars in defending you, at the end of the day, you would still have um, a million dollars to protect you against any judgment. Now you gotta be careful because there, there's some insurance companies out there that sneak what's called an eroding limits uh, provision into a policy that all of a sudden would uh, change that so that as you, you're, every dollar you're spending defending yourself, defending yourself is actually reducing your limits. It's pretty rare, but it's, it's something like when you go to your insurance broker, just to make absolutely certain that that broker is providing you with a GL policy that where the defense costs are outside of the limits. Um, the other thing too is, is there are typical um, limitations on, on the amount of coverage. So let's say you take out a million dollar policy with a million dollar per occurrence limit and a million dollar general aggregate limit. What that does is it lumps all the possible claims that you can have in one year within one limit of liability. So if you have a slip and fall and that you spend $200,000 resolving that, um, all you've got left on the remainder for a potential products claim is, is you know, 800,000. And so always keep in mind what, what I advise is get a higher general aggregate limit. So if you have a million dollar per occurrence limit, have a $2 million general aggregate, and that'll give you another layer of protection. And then of course, a, a, once you start getting up there and, and your product is, is getting distributed all over the country and you're getting exposure in multiple um, uh, locations, um, once you start thinking that, that 
a million dollars may not be enough. Some folks will go to their primary insurer and say, hey, I need a $2 million policy or a $5 million policy. And that's not always the smartest thing to do. Sometimes the better thing to do, in fact, most of the time, the better thing to do is to go ahead and purchase a separate standalone excess liability policy. So at the first layer of coverage, that's pretty expensive because that is the insurer that takes on the biggest exposure. But by purchasing a second excess following form policy, that it's rare that you're going to get to that layer of coverage. So the premiums are actually cheaper. Um, so often I see, well, a million dollar primary structure, you know, with a $4 million um, excess sitting over it. And one of the questions we always get, get asked is, well, how, how much is enough? How, how much insurance should I have? And that's, it all depends on a case by case basis. You have to go through um, a, a risk analysis and see what, you know, if you're, if you're selling and, or manufacturing and selling trampolines, I, I can tell you, you're gonna be looking at 10, more than $10 million in total coverage. But if, you know, we had a client we were talking to a couple of weeks ago and, and they've gone international and, and they're selling prenatal uh, vitamins to, to women um, who are expecting. And so the, the chances of them getting hit um, on, a, on a, you know, massive case or, or a class or something like that, it, it's probably pretty slim. So um, that's way different than, you know, manufacturing skateboards or, or trampolines or things like that. And I, I know we're right at our limit, so I apologize. I hope I've given enough time to um, feel some questions. Lee, there are two points in the chat. Can you pull those up and respond to them? It's um, UL fits in this as well, right? And can you expand on UL being viewed as required versus a nice versus nice to have? Uh, yeah, I actually um, I did respond to those in this chat box here. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, whoever asked those questions can see the responses. Um, I, I don't know that they're all out there. Okay, and we had two questions that. I don't think are still pending. Um, yeah, I see no. Yeah, I think you, I think you all covered questions. everything. Okay. Well, all right, thank, thank you. Then. Yeah, thank you all for doing that. Really informative. Um, appreciate you you being a part of Denver Startup Week, and uh, we'll see you next time around. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much.